Hi, Justin. Great that you took time to uh, have this interview, and uh, I'm very happy that you are here and that you will um, will discuss uh, some of your research today. Thanks, Walter. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm very um, fond of your work, and I think it's fascinating that you take a broader view on the research of of Reiki. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I um, started doing kind of participant observation research on a variety of different energy healing practices uh, around 2001, 2002, uh, when I was just post undergraduate. Um, and I had started doing this research. It was a, a funded kind of postgraduate uh, research year by the Watson Fellowship. Uh, I was looking at not just Reiki, but also Kundalini Yoga, Qigong healing, um, different Japanese uh, new religious movements, including Joe Rei and Mahikari. Yes. And then uh, I, you know, continued practicing Reiki and some other uh, forms of healing myself for a while. And just kind of wondered, what if I kept going with this? You know, there's not really a lot written, particularly about Reiki. I mean, there was some academic literature in the sociology of spirituality and in uh, the study of kind of the new age and you know kind of american religious history and also in europe as well uh that, that talked about reiki but there was, there was no real study on reiki there was no academic monograph on reiki and, and uh so in my master's program and then my phd program you know i was really trying to work to uncover uh, some of that history that really had not been adequately told. And I think, you know, still, you know, with my cohort, uh, with myself and Yoyan Yonker, who you've interviewed, and uh, Robert Fuston, who, you know, even though he wasn't doing his Reiki research for uh, an academic degree, you know, has training in uh, library science and also as a Chinese uh, medical expert. And I think, yeah. you know, his, yeah. his perspective is really interesting as well. Uh, Dory Beeler, not looking at the history, but the anthropology of Reiki. Uh, Na, uh, Na, Hirano Naoko in Japan, who uh, is hopefully finishing up her dissertation right now. Um, that all of us kind of were trying to fill in some of these gaps in the literature that recognized Reiki was important, but I think hadn't sufficiently plumbed the depths of you know what what is out there. And and now that we have this kind of foundation of research. I mean, I think it's time for the next generation to start filling in some of the gaps. But at the same time, uh, you know, there's, there are things that we may never know, right? There, there's a lot in terms of particularly of Reiki's early history, uh, where there's just kind of a lack of sources. Uh, I did my best to try to catalog some of the early students of Takata. A number of the people I interviewed for my dissertation work have uh, made their transition, you know, in the last uh, you know, since I talked to them mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah, the, the amount that we know on some hand, you know, some, some new materials have been uncovered. I'm really looking forward to Olaf Bohm's book. Um, he has a bunch of, uh, materials from the Usui Deiki Ryoho Gakkai from the 1920s and 1930s oh, really? that, oh. uh, no, no one's really had access to before. Um, but on the other hand, there's certain resources that are passing away as, uh, you know, the, the elders move on to the, the next realm and uh, we lose access to their interviews, except for maybe through uh, channeling or... Uh, yeah, you know, yeah that, that's right. W what's his name, Olaf? Bohm. Olaf Bohm. B-O-Umlaut H-M. Boom. Olaf Boom. Oh, Boom. Never heard about him. Okay, yeah, he's a Gendai Komyo guy. Ah, I see, and, I see. Uh, yeah, he, he has some stuff online that he's, but it's not, his research has not really yet been published and, and I, I'm pushing him. I can't wait for the book. It's going to be, it's going to be really important. Uh, so he's shown me some of the materials, but he asked me, you know, please don't write about this yet until I get, and of course, you know. Yeah, I've, I've um, uh, come to research Reiki since I was uh, into first degree because I always was fascinated by uh, that subject and at that time uh, there was not much available about uh, true history of Reiki. Oh, yeah. I think you really made a made new standards 
by doing in-depth research, like getting your hands on documents from Hawaii, these, uh, these um, uh, news, uh, these magazines where also something was written about Takada. How did you get this idea to, to wrap that? You know, that's a good question. I, it was it was collaboration with um, Hirano, who I mentioned before, who's doing her PhD at Waseda University. Um, she and I started interviews. So we met, I think, in January 2012. And she had already been to Hawaii one time mm -hmm. and uh, networked with this um, professor at the University of Hawaii, Hilo, named, um, I, I'm afraid I'm good, I think it's Masafumi Honda. I, I, I'm afraid I may have messed up his given name, uh, but it's definitely Honda Sensei, I think it's Masafumi. Um, he runs what's called the, the Hawaii Japan Center in Hilo. Mm -hmm. and, and she had reached out to him about whether there were Nisei, whether there were second generation Japanese Americans living in Hilo who had practice Reiki and there were, and he knew some of them. And so she asked me, would I want to go to Big Island with her and interview some of these elders? Um, her English isn't so good and their Japanese maybe isn't so good. So together we did these interviews. And I think it was around that time that we started wondering what was available in Japanese language uh, press at that time. So there were, there were a number of different Japanese language newspapers in Hawaii uh, in the pre-war period. And I think it was then that we, that we started thinking about that. And unfortunately, uh, you know, in Hawaii, they only exist on microfilm. And I don't know if you've ever done historical work on microfilm, yeah. but it, it's very difficult on the eyes and particularly my Japanese reading, if I have a text and I can sit with it with a dictionary and I, I, I can work through a text, but to scan through microfilm looking for a particular word, looking for, it, it's very time consuming even in English, let alone Japanese. So we agreed that she would do a return trip to go through, um, particularly we had the uh, rough dates of Hayashi Sensei's visit to Japan and that she would go through and start looking for that. So she was really, did the legwork um, on that. And then once she, um, found this in the, uh, the University of Hawaii at Manoa um, Library, um, where I had done my master's work. And so I was able to um, get her some affiliation there and uh, some resources and access and all this stuff. Um, then she found out that there was a library in Japan that actually had better versions of all of the newspapers from that time. And then she was able to get higher quality prints. And then also, um, I, I'm sure you've probably seen the book by Masaki Nishina um, and his, oh, he's a student of Jikiden Reiki. He's a student of, of Tadao Yamaguchi. He has a very good website um, that I'm grateful for where he was able to find a few articles that we didn't find. So, I mean, it's been a very collaborative effort, I want to say. Great, and, great. I love and then it. also, and then in, so then I also worked with the Takata Archive Project, um, mm -hmm. Phyllis Furumoto, uh, had heard about my work, I think through Yoyan introduced us originally. Mm -hmm. And it was just good timing in a way. I had, I had wanted to reach out to her for years mm -hmm. and had been kind of intimidated to. And Yoyan, as a Dutch man, <laughs> doesn't know the restraint. And <laughs> he was like, oh yeah, you want to meet Phyllis? I'm writing an email to introduce you. And he didn't ask me permission. He didn't ask me, do you want to meet Phyllis? He said, no, no, you have to talk to Phyllis. So he wrote this introduction email. And it was, it was in this time where Phyllis's own mother, Alice uh, Takata Furumoto, was in her kind of final years and in in the end of her life. And Phyllis, I think, was at this point where she wanted to deal with these materials Mm -hmm. that she never really, she knew they were very important, but she never knew how to properly deal with them. Yeah. And the fact that Yoyan introduced me at this time when Phyllis was starting to come to terms with, I have this historical legacy. Of course, she also had her own cancer, which, you know, um, had metastases um, in, in this, at around this time as well. So there was a lot of different factors yeah. where finally she said, 
okay, I have these boxes of historical materials from my grandmother. Something needs to be done with them. And all of a sudden she was introduced to this guy doing historical research, talking to his grandmother's early students in Hawaii, looking at Japanese language materials from Hawaii. And she thought, okay, this is a guy who could actually figure out what to do with this stuff. Yeah. And so um, working with Phyllis and Joyce, Paul and Susan Mitchell, um, and Robert Fuston, uh, we went through these boxes, cataloged everything that we had, digitized stuff, um, figured out things, you know, the fact that I could read the Japanese, I could actually figure, she had paid for Japanese language translations in the early 90s of a lot of this material, and then she basically sat on most of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but she had also in those holdings, certain materials that weren't any, no, that no one else had had yet. And some of those are very interesting as well. So yeah, it's really been a, a whole, collaborative effort putting all this stuff together it took many years and uh hopefully there's still you know some stuff to be turned up but yeah this is where we're at yeah that's great i love these kind of networking things you know and i think that there are so much open question because i think for example um uh Jujiro hayashi was teaching takada a lot of things which did not show up in the furumoto generation of masters at least not as far as I know, uh, like we we would know, what? Like like what, for example? Oh, like like the Japanese Reiki methods, you know, these kind of, uh, these clearing methods and uh, breathing and so on. We, um, don't, we don't know, actually, is that, I mean, the Yamaguchi lineage. They have it. They have it, and the, and the Komyo lineage, they have. It's also you know, in the books of Hayashi. They, 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 okay, but in terms of the, 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 the yeah, the, um, dry bathing, Kenyoku, uh, breathing and exercise, and and many other things. Breathing exercise, she, Takata did teach. Oh, okay. um, that uh, John Harvey Gray's lineage uh, has that. But you're right that I think in in Usui Shiki Ryoho, nothing. The the breathing technique, and also I think what what uh, Takata called the Reiki blessing, yeah. which is Reju. Um, mm. They all, she also taught, but yeah, I agree that there that Usui Shiki Ryoho over time de-emphasized certain practices uh, that that Takata learned from Hayashi and taught to her students, but that there was kind of a re. I mean, you also have to recognize that in the 1980s, I think there was a real challenge. Um, mm -hmm. Phyllis's training, you know, to be respectful. Um, under Takata, even though she had she had practiced Reiki, maybe you know since she was a very, you know, a child really, um, in terms of her training to be a master, she she spent some time apprenticing. You know, she she traveled with her, she uh, taught with her, um, but you know she was really asked to be her successor with you know in the last year of Takata's life. Mm -hmm. um, she had about 18 months of, of apprenticeship and then to be a, the successor, you know, less than a year. Mm -hmm. And Takata, I think, didn't expect, she was a very psychic woman. You know, she had a lot of premonitions. She had a lot of visions. I think she did not expect to make her transition when she did. Mm -hmm. uh, she told Phyllis, right? Phyllis was, um, wanted to come or visited her. She came to visit her in the hospital uh, outside or in Seattle or outside of Seattle in uh, early December uh, 1980 when she had her heart attack and Takata said what are you doing here you have to go teach <laughs> she said, I'll see you in Iowa for Christmas and then she didn't make it to Christmas so I, I think if things had gone a little differently and if there had been more time for Phyllis to get I think more detailed instruction, more direct instruction on what to do with the lineage, I think things would have gone very differently, obviously. And, and I think that it was a, a difficult situation in the 1980s for her to, and for the community, to reconcile what does it mean to be a grandmaster? Um, what does it, what does Usui Shiki Ryoho actually consist of, right? There was this, this process of systematization that was continued from Takata. Takata did her own systematization, mm -hmm. right, from what she learned from Hayashi. And 
um, they had to make certain decisions. You know, the development of the the the, the aspects and the elements, um, the choice to de-emphasize certain practices, to standardize the foundation treatment. I think more than Takata really had. Uh, you know, their choices were made for sure. But I think that you also have to take into perspective the difficulty of the situation they were in, of of inheriting this legacy of yeah. being wholly responsible for it, right? Of having no real contact with the history, with the Japanese lineages. It's easy to look back from our perspective now and be critical, but I think to really sympathize with the situation in the 1980s and the 1990s, um, I think gives a really different perspective on those choices. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I've also heard that there was a master teaching on Hawaii Island, which made the first two degrees with Takada and then got the third degree from Hayashi, but he never trained uh, master students. Yeah, so actually it's, it's interesting you ask about him. I've actually just been in touch again with his son um, because some other people were asking about it. And so I got back in touch with him and he shared some more stuff with me. And then he asked his family on the big island and they found in the family Butsudan the certificates. So now we have a much more full picture of that story. Um, oh. And I could tell a little bit if you're, if yes, you're interested. Please, please. So, so um, this man's name was Tatsuji Nagao. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I, if I knew we were gonna talk about him, I would have looked a little bit more, reviewed my notes on his life story, but he was a first generation uh, migrant to Hawaii Island. Um, He had originally been sent, I believe, by his parents. He, I think he's from Hiroshima Prefecture. And he had been sent by his parents to bring back, I forget if it was his brother or his uncle, who had, moved, who had gone to Hawaii to work and was, I think, getting into trouble there. And so he was sent to bring him home. And then he ended up staying. And um, he, he made some money. He, he was um, a tinsmith. And so he made metal implements, even while he was working on the plantations, He made metal implements, bento boxes and lanterns and things like that for his coworkers. And so he made some money and he invested it in land and he, he started um, uh, farming his own sugar cane. Mm -hmm. And he had a big family. I think there were maybe 10 or 11 kids. Oh, wow. And uh, he learned Reiki. So we have the photo of his uh, Shoden class, his first degree class with Takata in December 1938, in what I believe was her first class she taught on the Big Island, wow. uh, which was at a, a Japanese Buddhist temple outside of Hilo, actually near where she would end up moving a couple of years later uh, in, uh, in, in Kurdistan, so just kind of south of Hilo. And um, what appears to be, so I wasn't really sure about this history when I wrote my dissertation, it'll be updated for the book, Uh, but it, it's a lot clearer now with the certificates that we found, or that, that, that they found, the family found. Um, but it seems like he took his shoden with Takata mm -hmm. in 38. And then he, after the war in 49, his eldest son, I want to say, one of his sons was, he had worked for military intelligence services during the war, which was a common thing for Japanese American mm -hmm. uh, army who could, if they were bilingual, or they could help translate Japanese uh, you know, communications and things like yeah, that, yeah. Um, interrogate prisoners of war, things like that. And so he had, work, he had worked for military intelligence services in the Pacific during the war, and then he worked for the Japanese, the American occupation of Japan after the war. Yeah. And so in 49, they went to visit him in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And he knew, so Hayashi, Chujiro was dead, but Hayashi Chie was the head of the Kenkyukai at that time. And he knew that she was there, um, I guess, through Takata, right, who he had studied with. And somehow the son was able to get in touch with her and arranged for the father to meet her. Um, and so the father, the wife, And um, the, their youngest son, who had come to Hawaii, as who had come to Japan with them, who was, I want to say 11 at the time, maybe 10 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. He was born in 38, so I think he was 11 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, 
went to the Kenkyukai with the oldest son. So the four of them met Hayashi Chie, and she uh, was like, wow, you know, you're a student of Takata. She knew Takata, of course. She and Takata had a correspondence. Takata had lived with them. So she, I mean, there was this connection there. Um, and apparently, so she um, gave the Shodan initiation to the son, the wife, I believe, and the, the two sons and the wife, I believe, and she was giving him Okuden, the, the second degree. Yeah. And, but apparently when she was giving him Okuden, she felt his hands and she said, you know, you're really powerful Reiki. You know, you have powerful Reiki, as they say in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and so she wanted to give him more. Mm -hmm. um, and what originally the, what the daughter had told me and the son, the son and the daughter told me was that their father learned how to do the initiations. So I figured this was Shimpi Den, that he was a master, as you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but the actual certificate, which we just got, I mean, like a month ago, yeah. um, from 1949, it's not a Shimpi Den certificate the way that Takata's looks. It's, it's a certificate that says that she gave him the Kolki hole, the breath technique, and the um, Reiju hole, the way, the means of giving Reiju. But it doesn't say anywhere on it Shimpiden. Um, and it may be a kind of what um, Jikiden calls, um, what is it, Shihankaku? Shihankaku, yeah, see, si, we. Oui. Yeah, the, the, the first level of being a master. It's not like a full master yet. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. maybe you can initiate other people to Shoden. You can initiate right. other people to first degree. Right. And it seems like that's what he received okay. um, when he was there. And and like you said, he never taught commercially. He initiated members of his family. He initiated his grandchildren. Um, and that that's all. He and this family, I mean it's very interesting. He believed Reiki was more of a folk healing practice. He was very critical of Takata for having a commercial practice. Mm -hmm. um, and he practiced, he healed people. There's lots of, you know, miracle stories of his healing and people, I mean, really have these transformative experiences with his practice, but he never charged a set fee. Um, people gave him gifts out of their gratitude. And he believed that was the proper model. He was critical of Takata for having a clinic, for charging set fees, for only treating people for one hour. Um, he said, one hour, you know, you're basically, you're just getting started at one hour. What do you, what do you, one hour and she's done. You know, so these are stories that I heard from their family about how, you know, he was critical of his own teacher for what he saw. You know, this is in 1940, 1941, you know, in the 1940s, I mean, people were already complaining you know, Reiki, it used to be better. Now it's, you know, great. I mean, this, this degeneration narrative, I mean, it's a perennial thing. You look at Buddhism in, you know, a thousand years ago, people were complaining, this isn't the, what the old time Buddhism used to be. You know, I mean, it's a, yeah. it's, it's always people who complain about the, the degeneration yeah. in every generation. So anyway, there's a long, long winded story, but uh, oh, it's a very interesting um, example of these kinds of other lineages maybe you might say that, that never really um that, that kind of died out really in the I in the see. story of reiki and and although i kind of argue in my dissertation i mean it's, it's a bit different but i think that the way you know takata taught in different communities right she taught in the bay area she taught in chicago she taught in bc i mean those are the some of the biggest areas she, other places too but those were kind of the major uh, places she taught in North America. And I, I think the BC community, which was, you know, a lot of kind of hippies and, you know, people, alternative types, people living off the grid, people, you know, back to the land, um, agricultural. I think that that community was a lot closer in some ways to the kind of people who were learning Reiki on the big island in the 1930s yeah. and 40s, where it was done in their community. There was not a lot of commercialization of it. Um, people were, um, you know, encouraged to learn and then practice within the community, the Reiki circles. Um, 
treatments were done sometimes for barter. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that in some ways, you know, it's maybe closer to the, the, what was in the big on, but also you got to remember, that's not what was like in Japan. No. no. Uh, in, in Japan, right. It, you, Usui was criticized in his time for charging too much money for <laughs> membership of the Gakkai. That's why, um, uh, Eguchi, right. Started the, the Tenohira Ryoji, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which, you know, the palm healing, Eguchi Toshihiro, one of Usui's students, he, the reason he started it, he says, is because Usui charged too much money. It was only for the, the super elite um, upper class people. And he thought, you know, this is so miraculous. We got to spread it to more people. And it's funny to see, you know, these conflicts from the 1920s get recapitulated in the 1990s or what have you, right? Or 1980s, 1990s. William Lee Rand and others, yeah. you know, saying $10,000 for a master. No, it doesn't make any sense. And so, History yeah. repeats itself. Yeah. I think that, that some of those ways where Takata was criticized for being too materialistic, mm -hmm. the ten thousand dollars for the master, I think that actually was preserving some of the stuff she had been taught. Yeah. Um, you know, Hayashi, she the story goes, she said she had to sell her house to become a Reiki master. That might be true. Um, she owned a home in Kauai mm -hmm. that she, you know, her husband, her late husband, she inherited from him. And after she became a master, she didn't really live there anymore. Um, she moved to Honolulu. Uh, it's not really entirely clear. You know, I don't have the, the smoking gun, but I think she may have actually sold her house to become a Reiki master. Uh, I, I think that that was the way at that time, you know. Yeah. So, so some of that, you know, even if, and this is something that will be cleared up in Olaf's book, you know, but in terms of, uh, you know, did the Gakkai charge for treatments? Um, you know, did Hayashi charge for treatments? Um, you know, that we don't have evidence that's in the public sphere yet that, that says one way or another on that. But um, certainly to learn Reiki was a very expensive endeavor. And so the, while, while her narrative about like the exchange of energies mm -hmm. and Usui in the beggar camp, you know, the famous story of Usui in the beggar camp, yeah. it seems that she developed this as a way of explaining things Very that she had learned, even yeah. though she developed those narratives maybe on her own, these were things that she learned, mm -hmm. that, that Reiki should not be given away for free, mm -hmm. that there are um, maybe spiritual teachings around money and around you know, investment in one's own healing process and one's own education. So I mean, yeah, this is something that, that's a little bit unclear, and I'm hoping it's going to clear up a little bit more, is the relationship between money and Reiki in 1920s, 1930s Japan. But uh, it, it does seem that that is something that she did inherit from Japan. And maybe when her students in Hawaii were pushing back against it, it was in the spirit of Eguchi, who in Japan in the 1920s was also not comfortable with how expensive it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that's very interesting. What what um, puzzled me when I came to know it first was that she, um, well, she was exchanging the no, not exchanging, um, changing the the ancient master symbol to a new master symbol, and I always wondered why the heck did she do that, or is it what, just I'm, I'm, is it, what, what is it? I don't know what you're referring to by the ancient master symbol. Well, uh, the Chokurei was was a master symbol at Uzui's and Hayashi's time, and as far as I know, they did not know. We have we have evidence for that. I don't. I've never heard that before. Well, I, I just know that uh, in in uh, the let's say Japanese uh, Reiki lineages, they don't have a Daikomyo. Um, we don't really know. I the mm -hmm. absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Let's That's say, right. <laughs> right? You can't. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, Walter, I think you froze. Uh, uh, no. Yeah, uh, you froze. Ah, now you're moving again. Okay, yeah, yeah, you froze too. What I was saying is, you know, do you know the expression, um, evidence of, sorry, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? Absolutely. And, and, you know, the one piece of evidence that we have heard, but I, I'm a little suspect of it, is Hiroshi Doi claims to have seen these handwritten notes 
from a student of Usui, but he says, you know, I wasn't allowed to photograph them or something like this, but that in those notes, Usui taught about daikomyo. Who, who's to say? I mean, I, I agree that, that, that um, you know, that first of all, this term is a very common term in Japanese. It, it basically means enlightenment or, you know, great, great light, great bright light, you know. Um, was that used in some way by Usui and Hayashi? We don't really, I want to say we don't really know. Mm -hmm. Was it used in the way that Takata used it? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, that's fair to say. But um, when you say that the ancient or the Usui era master symbol, I don't think we have any evidence there was, you know, a symbol that's used the same way that Takata used Daikomyo. Um, as far as my my knowledge goes about the Japanese Reiki lineages, uh, they don't don't use the Daikomyo. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's and that's of that, they impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at the same time, the Japanese Reiki lineages today also underwent changes from Usui's time. It, it could be mm -hmm. that she learned something that she preserved that then died out in Japan. I mean, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's one thing or the other, I'm just saying it's possible. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. and the same way that Takata taught different things to different master students, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, Usui, this is kind of Doi's argument, I think, is that Usui may have taught different things to different master students, And when, Us when Ushida took over the, the Usui Gakkai, he, you know, changed things a little bit to be what he learned. And when, you know, uh, Taketomi took over after Ushida, you know, he may have changed things a little bit, you know, what he learned. And so each generation of leadership, you know, has maybe a little bit different style. Yes, of course. So it's possible. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know one way or another. That's all I want to say about in terms of, um, Takata's use of Daikomyo in the 1970s, um, when she started making masters. Uh, Robert Fuston has done some interesting, you know, research on the, the initiation, the, the master initiation, which is in his book. Um, I think, you know, some people contest some of that stuff, but I, I, I think, you know, he's done really great work on that. I don't know, did you, I, I watched your interview with him, but I forget if you guys talked about that. Oh, we we just uh, we just uh, were talking a little bit about that, but it's in, in fact a focus of my own research about what exactly is the initiation. So, what are the core elements of it, so to say? Well, have, you, have you talked to Leon Horowitz yet? Uh, yes, I did. I interviewed him. He's also on my my channel. Well, I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah, yeah, but you see, I think it's important to have a a broader view of that. So, for me, it's interesting. How is initiation being practiced in Qigong, in, in uh, the um, yoga lineages in, in uh, India? Because mm -hmm. uh, the basics of initiation are the same. It doesn't matter to which civilization, to which spiritual path you go. They are the same because people are the same. And, and yeah. then I try to make a transfer to, to Reiki. What, what is it? What makes an initiation? People talk so much about traditional Reiki. And I try to find out what is a traditional Reiki. <laughs> I mean, the, one of the kind of mantras of academia is, you know, tradition is invented, right, in each generation. And you have certain gatekeepers who say this is traditional and that is not. Yeah. And it's unsurprisingly, what is traditional is what they're teaching, right? And what is not is what the other people are teaching. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that happens in Reiki a lot as well. Yeah, yeah. What, what's fascinating me at the moment Uh, since some years, I, I learned to um, address the symbols of Uzui together with the deities which are related to them. And I guess I've seen you you write a little about this. I'm really interested to know more about how did you find how did you find this? What's the uh, that's a little bit weird. You know, most of what I do with Reiki is weird because I I remember former lives, and uh, I had a. Um, Enlightenment when I was uh, beginning of the 90s in, in uh, the Bretagne at Mont Saint-Michel. And from that moment on, I took my memories of former lives more serious. So most of what I teach, I remembered from former lives and was putting them into a way to teach them today. And one thing which I, well, I saw my first angel when I was two and a half years old. And since this time, angels are for me, let's say, familiar. 
And of course, they don't answer any, every question you have to them, but sometimes they give you some information when they think it's interesting. And they, they told me to look into the relationship between symbols and deities. So I did. And when I started to develop, let's say, a, a formal way to address them, then suddenly the symbols had a much wider impact. I could do much more about that um, wow. than before. For example, uh, I found a way to strengthen someone um, between 30 to 50 percent measurable uh, within 10 seconds. And uh, just because I expanded um, the use of symbols with the deities and many other things. And I yeah. think I'm just at the beginning. So what well, I, think, I think you're really onto something there because so uh, have you, do you know the term Kaji Kito? Uh, a Kaji, I know. Give okay. something from spiritual. Sorry. Uh, Kaji, I, I know that is giving and taking from spiritual beings. So yeah, well, it's, it's what it's what you're talking about is yeah. is connecting with a deity, connecting with a, a Buddha, a Bodhisattva, a heavenly being, and basically embodying them, right? To to um, receive their powers in a way yes. to connect with them yes. and embody them and have them work through you yes. is yes. is the essence of esoteric buddhism right it's what, what, what's someone's called in english like deity yoga ah, right okay. okay and so um i believe the symbols are very much rooted in that tradition i okay. I, I completely agree with you it's, it's interesting you came to that kind of intuitively through mm -hmm. you know revealed knowledge because i think with my path in terms of academic research, I think concords with that. That that um, uh, particular, but so but I was interested though. So so was, it was it all you know? I saw you talk about uh, Dainichi Nyorai, yes. and then you talk about Marishi Ten, yes. Um, and then but there's three symbols. What, what, what's your you have, you have those two? Did you have a third one as well? Canon, canon. there is canon. Of course. Okay, that's I didn't I didn't know I didn't know of that sort. Okay, but Ami, Amida Buddha doesn't have any. Oh uh, well, in... I I didn't find a connection to Amida Buddha so far. Not a direct one, of course, an indirect okay. one. Via I mean, I think yeah, I think there are ways where Canon and Amida are linked, and um, my own research, I I think is indicating that um, the the second symbol, the what we call like the mental emotional symbol. Yeah. Um, has connections with Amida uh, as well. Yeah, so, I, I guess so. But also to dragons, to the dragon uh, where Kanon is riding on, you know. Hmm. These are the three fires which are in that in that symbol, which uh, have a relationship to that. What, what I'm also in is research about the Reiki symbol, the Reiki kanji, uh, hmm. of these three mouths, you know, these three squares which are in there. Yeah. Um, I did some uh, research uh, about something else in um, Chinese uh, medicine, and there I discovered the three Hun souls, which reside in the liver and okay. are eternal in comparison to the Po souls, which uh, start to exist when you start to exist here in a physical plane and they go sometime after you have made transition. And then I did some more research and I found out that there is a concept of um, higher self, middle self, and uh, inner child, or let's say Uni, Pili, Aumakua, and so on, on Hawaii. And that they say, if these three have the same opinion on something and make a prayer, the prayer comes true. And they use also in Huna the idea of rain coming from above. So that is exactly what the symbol says. And because the people on Hawaii came originally from Asia, I think it's not too far away, not too far stretched, that there might be a connection to these Hun souls and the Reiki symbol. It's really fascinating. I, I, uh, I've never heard anyone put it together like that before. So yeah, the, uh, the kind of Taoist, like inner alchemy stuff with, with Hawaiian. The one thing about Huna tradition, though, is that, um, what's his name? The guy who uh, wrote all, is it Serge Kalihi King? No, no that he came later. The NLP version of Huna, but that is not really who, original. Yeah, who's the guy? But there's one guy before him yeah. as well. Kahuna Magic by, um, gosh, what's his name? Um, he was in the beginning of last century. Yeah. But, but anyway, what I want to say, I think both of them also were interested yeah. in yeah. Western esotericism and, you know, were, uh, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say, you know, what Huna teaches is the authentic Polynesian 
you know, everything is constantly getting, and even, I mean, look at um, David Kalakawa, the, the um, you know, second to last monarch of the Hawaiian kingdom. Yes. Um, he was a theosophist. He lectured in theosophical societies. He was interested in the lost continent of Mu and Lemuria. And I mean, he, um, and he was responsible for what's called, you know, the Hawaiian revival, the Hawaiian cultural revival yes. at the end of the 19th century where, you know, the Christians had banned a lot of stuff, right? The, the monarchy had converted to Christianity and had outlawed hula and had outlawed, um, you know, the traditional medicines mm -hmm. and um, Kalakaua revived it. So in its revival 125 years ago, it was already wrapped up in theosophy. It was already wrapped, you know, so I, I, I just, I hesitate a little bit to say, okay, and because this person in the early 20th century was saying this is what traditional Polynesian culture is, no. that therefore there's this connection thousands of years back with Chinese, you know, the same root of esoteric Taoism, which itself has changed a lot. You know, I, I, yeah, I, I think that maybe, you know, if there's any connection, you know, it's possible like with the collective unconscious or with, you know, trying to access, you know, the, the, the you know, hidden truths about human experience and spirit. And I mean, I'm not ruling that out by any means, but yeah, to say there's these kind of epigenetic linkages that go back from the Polynesian migration, I, I think that's a bit of a harder sell for me, you know? <laughs> I, yeah. came to start um, when I was um, looking into Chinese uh, religion and there are the so-called Wu shamans. Yeah. And the Wu shamans, they have as their, their personal symbol, the Reiki symbol, which they mm -hmm. call Ling Chi, of course. Mm -hmm. And then I read more about the Wu shamans that when they wanted to get their specific healing abilities for which they were famous, in uh, springtime, they were going on one of the holy mountains in China and they meditated for some weeks there doing rituals and doing fastening. And then they came back and having these healing powers. Do you, you have a good book, you have a bo good book you recommend on the, on the Wu? It's, it's a German book. Uh, I can give you the title. I have to look it up in my library. It's uh, okay. not, not exactly about the Wu Shamans. It's about religions in ancient China. Mm. And it's an academic book. It's not an esoteric book. Okay. And uh, it, it gives you more insights about the Wu Shamans, which is quite fascinating. Because no, it's definitely fascinating. Uh, I, yeah. it, and, yeah. and, and there's, I think there is a, a common tradition from you know, Chinese Wu, through um, Korean, like Mu in yeah. Korean, to yeah. Japanese, uh, you know, what, what has become Shinto yes. uh, and, yeah. and different forms of mountain religion, um, you know, there is this continuity and this, uh, this passage of those types of teachings historically mm -hmm. uh, through the region, obviously with regional differences as well. well but uh, yeah, no, I, I do find that very interesting with that, that stuff. And, and uh, the way, I mean, the, the other thing though, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry to be a pain in the ass about this as a historian, but like the, the way that Usui Sensei understood Reiki in 1920s Japan, it's not obviously not identical to the way that, you know, shamans in, you know, early China, early imperial China, or even earlier understood Ling Chi, like ideas, evolve you know the same word has different meanings in different contexts mm -hmm. and uh yeah so th they're um that's right absolutely i agree yeah, uh, yeah. i just think that there are some working principles yeah. which people are look at from different cultural backgrounds but yeah. if you dig deeper and you find the working principle that's mm -hmm. always very yeah. much the same you know yeah yeah no definitely and i know and he wasn't you know like I mean, that's the interesting thing for me. I mean, it's not that, it's not that interesting, but it's a little interesting, I think, is that, you know, in the Hike, in, in the, the handbook, um, Usu, the, the uh, Deiki Ryoho Hike, the, oh. the book, the Gakkai handbook, um, yeah. you know, in the, the Q&A section, right? But at the beginning, Usui says, you know, I did not learn this from anybody. I did not study this from anybody. This is a wholly original therapy. No one's ever done anything like this before. And yeah, you see all these kinds of things. So, I mean, but then also in the Takata story, right, which, you know, people have said, oh, it's nonsense, whatever. I mean, there are, I think, seeds 
in it where she talks about he studied the sutras mm -hmm. and he studied the sutras in Chinese yeah. and he was he didn't get the answer he wanted so he studied the sutras in Sanskrit and he found the key and then he went to Kurama to practice the key and see does it really work and mm -hmm. I mean I think again I don't think that like Reiki, the system that Usui taught, was exactly oh. taken from one source or from another source. But there certainly are elements of things that he learned from different places that he integrated into the system that he taught. And yeah, I, I do think Kaji, um, you know, the symbol use, I do think initiation, um, I do think, um, you know, for example, the dry bathing, um, that to me looks very much like Shinto purification stuff on some level. Um, the recitation of the Meiji Emperor poetry to align one's heart, yeah. mind, you know, one's kokoro with the, the mind of the emperor. I mean, that itself almost is a kind of kaji, but it's like a, a you know, imperial worship kaji, yes. right? It's, it's, you know, recite this poetry and purify your heart. I mean, it's, it's because of your relationship with the emperor, right? Yes. And... So, I mean, there's so much interesting stuff going on in Usui's teaching. And then also in, in, I think, what you're doing in terms of, okay, this is one wisdom tradition, and there's all these other wisdom traditions, and on some level, they're doing similar things. So what can we integrate to, um, you know, empower? I mean, this is one of the things also that, I, uh, that I'm about is Usui only taught for four years. Yeah, you know, incredible. If he, if he kept going, he may have added more things to the teaching. So... And, you know, this idea, we have to stop. This is the way it's done. I mean, you know, I think in every generation, they've made changes. Yes. And, uh, you know, that, that and, and, and in every generation, there are conservative types who say, no, no, this way that it's done is the right way and no more, you know, more. So, you know, I, I, again, I think there's danger in, you know, unwise changes and in, in abrupt and hasty changes without understanding what you're changing. But I also think there's a danger in excessive formality and, you know, slavishness to a form that, that you don't really understand maybe either, right? I mean, there's the old joke about the, the lady who, um, you know, was learning how to make a pot roast and she, her mother, you know, tells her you cut off the end on uh, both ends and then you put it in the pan you know this joke yeah i know that joke yeah yeah and then, you know why that well joke. i don't know that's the way my mother taught me you know she calls her grandmother oh yeah you cut off the end you cut off the other end you put it in the pan. why oh that's how i learned from my older sister she has the other you know what she says oh because the pan i had it wasn't big enough it wouldn't fit in the pan and i had to cut off the two ends <laughs> you know and so yeah, yeah absolutely it's uh yeah I, I i think what always fascinates me is um to to find that that thin rope where you don't want to get something and where you do not you know get into a kind of stasis not changing something i i always had the experience that in the case where where i was very much looking for a solution for something but not with reiki or so and i was relaxed I got something I did not expect. But uh, when people are trying to get it, I think this tension which is in there prevents us from getting a blessing. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you yeah, did a lot of research about these people which lived at Uzui's time and also had a large hand healing movements, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was, there was hand healing movements. There was, a, I mean, not just hand healing, but yes, and also hand healing. A lot of different healing movements at that time. Uh, and yeah, some like the biggest ones um, actually, I think were more about kind of a little bit what you're talking about, about kind of opening up to the spirit world and um, having... Uh, you know, forces, spiritual forces working through the individual. Um, th those ones were the ones that got the biggest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there were lots of different hand healing movements at that time too. Yeah. But, uh, was it 
is it some something they had in common that they were working with Kanon or with uh, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara or the Amida Buddha? So it was about love and about compassion, these kind of things, and it's about the center, the Hara, or was this just one piece of the cake? The Hara, the Hara is very common. The developing, developing the, the, the lower abdomen, developing the belly mm -hmm. and strengthening the belly is a very, very common thing. Um, the Kanon connection is less common, but I don't know if you found this, but in the early form of Jode, mm -hmm. um, he also, Okada Mokichi, had a connection with Kanon. Oh, much so, yeah. Still today and, they have. And this, this idea, Kanon gave him this kind of pearl or this, this, orb and it went into his belly i believe yeah um and i mean so that there you see that but i i you know there i don't want to say there weren't there there certainly were healing traditions associated with with kanon going back i mean to the lotus sutra they talk about this i mean it's it's yeah um so you know but i'm just saying in usui's time these kind of like modern hand healing movements I don't actually know offhand very many other examples where they're where they are are drawing on this aspect of kind of esoteric Buddhist uh, healing practice the same way that Usui did. Mm -hmm. there, there, there was a form. Uh, there was there's one interesting one. Yeah. Where it was a form, almost of like chiropractic. Oh. Um, with manipulations that was tied to Amida. It was made by a Pure Land priest mm -hmm. who um, got interested in kind of vital force mm -hmm. and, um, and kind of developed his own form of like osteopathic manipulation or chiropractic manipulation that he said was to allow Amida's love basically to enter the body. That, that, that... Yeah physiological, um, you know, problems prevented one from really connecting with Amida properly. Ah, okay. Yeah. So it was a kind of reflex zone thing. Sorry? So it seems to be a kind of reflex zone thing. Reflex zone? Yeah, that, that uh, when they relate massage to opening up to the spiritual, then th they might use reflex zones to align energies or so in the body yeah yeah i don't know i don't know what reflex zone a reflex zone like in the hand that there is a reflex oh. zone for the heart reflex zone. oh, oh yeah yeah the points yeah um i'm not sure how much I, I you know i just read a little bit about this guy i'm not sure how much they used the the points or whether i i think it was about spinal alignment i think it was closer to chiropractic but yeah i'm not i'm not entirely sure about that but i've, I've just read a little bit uh about this guy and it, it, it seems very interesting yeah but but it was just it came to mind because it was an example of kind of a combination of these types of practices right where of course hand healing was big in in the u.s at this time too the mesmeric healing the magnetic healing um you know this is one of the things that i, I mentioned in my dissertation mm -hmm. uh but you know there's there's i think more work to be done on it these translations of books that were written originally in English into Japanese were part of what informed Usui and his contemporaries. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. You, uh, you, uh, you didn't read about what I wrote about uh, Rama Charaka? So there was this guy in, um, in Chicago in the 19... I mean, he starts writing, I guess, in the 1890s, but really in the first decades of the 20th century, he gets very, very uh, prolific. Um, his name is uh, William Walker Atkinson. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so he, he uh, writes the, the, Kabbal the Kabbalion, Kab Kabbalion, I actually don't know how to pronounce it, but it's a very uh, important kind of esoteric text of the time. Um, and he writes um, a lot of new thought, right? The, how to use the power of your mind to, to change reality. Um, but he writes a, num a series of books under the uh, pseudonym Yogi Ramacharaka oh. that are about the the science of breath mm -hmm. right uh, pranayama um about and he has one about the 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 psychic healing the science of psychic healing um where 
he talks about, I mean, you read this stuff. I, I had a friend of mine who I turned on to this book and he said, it's like I'm reading about Reiki. I mean, it's, it, there's so many parallels. Yeah. And this book got translated into Japanese in 1916 and was a very popular book. It seems like at the time, a lot of Japanese, um, a lot of Japanese authors in this kind of subculture reference it. Okay. And so there's a lot in there that could easily have influenced Usui as well. Um, where if not directly, maybe influenced other therapists and then Usui learned about those other therapists. And, but somehow, you know, Ramacharaka seems to be an important source of information or William Walker Atkinson. And he himself was combining things from the mesmeric healing movement, yeah. things from yoga, yeah. things from new thought mm -hmm. um, into what he called pranic healing. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, 20 years or so before Usui starts teaching, 15, 20 years or so before Usui starts teaching, and then comes over to Japan and gets translated into Japanese. And one of the things they use to translate prana into Japanese is the term Reiki. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I mean, there, it's, it's very interesting, kind of all of the different conflux of influences, you know, from traditional Japanese religion, which itself comes from Korea and China and India, you know, Silk Road in India. And then some of this like new psychic healing kind of stuff, which is coming from America. And some of that's coming from India and some of it's coming from Europe and some of it's homegrown American, you know, innovations. And Usui lived at this time where he was combining all of these different influences into a wholly original practice that I never, studied with anyone before you know and um yeah so and this is our legacy so it's 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 possible that he also was familiar with mesmer mesmeric hand healing uh yeah maybe ind indirectly maybe yeah yeah indirectly I've, but, I've, but in hypnotism too hypnotherapy was very big um in japan yeah the first century sorry the first decade of the 20th century uh from about 1903 to 1908 or so, there was this period um, that, you know, retro retrospectively has been called like the hypnotism boom in Japan, where um, this was, I mean, in all the newspapers, they're talking about it. Um, scientists are doing experiments on it. I mean, it was very, um, a, lo a lot of public interest mm -hmm. in this. And so, you know, Usui Sensei would have been in his 40s at this time. He would have been very, you know, aware of all this talk about hypnotism and the power of the mind and a lot of stuff about hypnotherapy, about you know how can you use the mind to heal the body, which we see in Reiki, right? Which yeah. we, with it, yeah, he says that in the, right in the intro again to the Q and A, that when the mind is healthy, the body will naturally become healthy. Yes, for yeah. sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's interesting. Uh, I, um, I, I wondered, uh, Uzui was a, a Qigong master. He was in a yearbook about uh, 1910 or 19, 1912 as a very famous Qigong master in Japan. I've never seen, I've seen people reference this. I've never seen the actual source. I've seen the book with someone, but I couldn't get my hand on it, unfortunately. Okay. If you have any information about that, because I've seen a lot of people, uh, William Rand uh, like references this a lot. Yeah. Um, I've never seen the actual source for that. So I'd yeah. be very interested. I've seen the page with a picture of Uzui on it and some Japanese I couldn't couldn't read, but the the beginning of the whole thing was a Qigong yearbook. Okay, and, and where if you're able to say, where did you see this? Who who has this book? It was a someone who, who got this from Japan, but I think that he traded it for something. So I, I did not meet this person again. It was an acquaintance. Are you sure it's not the article from the 1980s from the Twilight Zone magazine? No, 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 no. Okay. It was purely Japanese. Well, that's that's purely Japanese. Yeah. That's that's written in Japanese in 1980s. Okay, I, I don't know. It, it looked very old, so it looked did not look like a Okay, I, yeah, I um if you have any more information about that, I, I think that yeah, an important source, yeah. Um I've never I've never seen anything about Usui Sensei published before 1922, you know, which is uh, supposed to be the year for the, the handbook. That's, um, you know, I found this interesting because I also traveled Hong Kong 
uh, because through the martial arts I did since the age of eight, I had some, uh, let's say, over some corners, uh, some uh, relation to uh, people doing uh, Qigong since long time in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I asked them about Ling Chi because I wondered what, what they were doing in China with it. And they said, well, we know about that, but we do this only in the higher levels of Qigong because you need some time to build it up. And we understand it as um, as a quartermaster for for the Shin Ki, for the for the divine key. So if you if you have more Reiki, then the probability will grow that the divine key will be with you. Mm -hmm. And um, that I found very interesting. I thought, wow, uh, that's interesting because people usually say, well, Reiki is divine. But what I what I experience myself is when you treat yourself for a longer time, then your heart is expanding that you in a way love the client and i thought mm. wow that is something which invites the divine mm. so, yeah I, I heard renee vogley said something very beautiful about that he said about how you know sometimes a client will walk in and he'll you know not really feel like you know oh, this person like blah 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 but he said during the treatment he said, like, I fall in love with every single person I treat. Yes. And it, that, that, that is where yes. the, the power of the treatment comes from, is this, this love working through me. And, and um, yeah, and I think like you say, um, you know, coming, it's not coming from within you. It's like, a, you know, this, this feeling of a, of a divine love, you know, that you receive yeah. because it's, it's more perfect than a human love or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it, it is. And and I wonder whether this might be the reason for the uh, bottom part of, of the Honcha de Jolain with the Kokoro symbol, you know, because it seems to me a very, very fundamental thing. Uh, with the I mean, that that's part of the symbol for Nen, right, for mind, or yeah, for yeah. Uh, Nen. Uh, it's yeah. part of the Nen symbol, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you do enough etymology on... Um, you know the the characters of course yeah they, there's a relationship there mm -hmm. for sure um shonen yeah i mean there's a whole book to be written what is shonen i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think to a certain degree we can do research and uh, and some other things are open well maybe to our experience but i don't think the, that we can really rationalize about that Right, right. No, I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, I, there's a, this whole kind of push right now that it's all about non-duality. Oh. And so if it's about non-duality, that's beyond words. I mean, it's, it's you know, what, what, what can you say you know, once you get beyond the level of the... That, that might be interesting because some years ago I was doing more research about the symbols. So not exactly about what one symbol is doing, but what are these symbols doing when, when I do Reiki? Because some people think that they bring in another energy. But I never had the experience that there is, let's say, other principles at work when I put in an, uh, a symbol. So now I understood after a while that um, Reiki is not to be found in the yin or yang part of the yin-yang symbol, but everywhere where yin and yang were meeting. So mm. that the symbols are helping very specifically, very focused to change yin to yang and yang to yin and this makes a specific the specific value because they all have their pattern of how to make that yin yang change and it's not that they bring in other energy they just they work like a lens like a like a transistor walter me. that's the second time you've said something that's really um like i feel like you intuit through this non-rational way that i think also reflect something from my research that oh. um, in the in the Tomita Kaiji book that we're translating right now. Um, do you know about this translation project that Reiki Centers of America? Okay, you know Tomita Kaiji was one of no. um, he was a student of Usuide Kiryoho Gakkai who wrote a book in 1933, um, and he kind of started his own style. Mm -hmm. But obviously, some of the things that he our teaching is things that he learned from the, the Gakkai and, you know, and also his own kind of building on that and his own, you know, um, and uh, the section where he talks about Usui Sensei is very short, but one of the only things he says about Usui is that his teaching about Reiki 
is about the transformation of yin and yang. And about, and, and it's a very specific phrase. I think it's um, in yul, o yul, or something like that. That I, I had to look it up. It's like a technical term. It's not a common expression. And it's something they talk about in, in Chinese medicine, where it's literally about what you just said. It's about the transformation of yin into yang and yang into yin. And, he, and this is what he says. This was Usui Sensei's teaching about Reiki was about, was in yo o yo or something like that. So yeah, I mean, I think that you're really onto something there. I think that, 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 that one of the few sources we have from pre-war Japan is that the yeah. Usui Reiki Yoho Gakkai talked about this. Yeah. Well, thank you. That That is uh, great to know, you know. I, I've never thought about that. I always was wondering whether there's a source about that, but well, now you, you told it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's literally, it's four characters, but it's like yes. four characters in a very crucial juncture of yeah. this book. Yeah. Um, it's like the one, I think there's literally maybe two sentences about Usui Sensei in the book, and that's in one of them. <laughs> and that's like, the, and it kind of says it's like the essence of his teaching or something, so. Okay. Yeah. But, but this refers to the Hara because the Hara is in between yin and yang. And I, I've, read, I've uh, read in the in the Uzui handbook that Uzui did some Hara work. Yeah, yeah. The I Hara... Thought that in, in Takata's Reiki. She, no, she, I mean, she talked about it in her classes. Okay. Um, she didn't always explicitly talk about it. You know, she, Takata was an interesting individual, right? So she's not Japanese, Japanese. She's local Japanese from Hawaii. But I think she really wanted to do right by her teacher. Yes. And in her story, she tells about how she was scolded in Japan for asking too many questions. <laughs> that that. You, 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 learn it, you learn it from your teacher and you do it the way your teacher says, and you don't need to know all this stuff. You just do it. And maybe over time, your teacher will tell you more and more. But in the beginning, just do it like this and stop asking so many questions. And so I think she internalized that. Because I think she was a very curious person in her own way. But she internalized this kind of stern, no-nonsense way of teaching mm -hmm. a bit from her experience studying in Japan, I think. Yeah. This is my own kind of theory. So um, there's a tape of her teaching, I believe at the Trinity Metaphysical Center in Wedwood City around 1976 or so. It's quoted in Robert Fuston's book. Yeah. And apparently in his next book, he is going to talk more about this. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. I'm not sure if it's going to be in volume two or volume three. And I've been waiting for, you know, ever since volume one came out, I'm like, come on, man, where's, where's the next? Yeah, yeah, but, right, right. And I know people are impatient about my book too, so maybe I should have more compassion right. <laughs> with Robert and Olaf and, and everyone else. But um, the, uh, so in this tape, a student asks her, you know, kind of about, okay, how does this all work? Like, what's happening here? Like, how, where does the energy come from? How does it come into your body? And she keeps basically saying, like, don't worry about it, just do it. And they say, but no, but like, how does it work? Like, how does it work? How does it come into you? How do you get the energy? And she's like, okay, listen, you want to know? You've got an antenna that comes out of the top of your head. <laughs> and the Reiki comes into the antenna. And, you know, and when I, when I give you the initiation, basically, I'm raising your antenna. Mm -hmm. And the Reiki comes into your antenna and it charges your battery. And your battery is at the, at the bottom of your stomach. Mm -hmm. And when your battery is charged, that's what allows you to have the Reiki come out of your hands. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing she said was that um, if you haven't done Reiki for a long time, you know, a student was worried, you know, what happens? Do you lose your Reiki? She said, well, if you haven't practiced in a long time, the best thing to do is to treat you know, one, two, three, four, I don't know, you know, one, two, three, yeah, four, yeah. treat your abdomen and that will recharge your battery and then you can do Reiki again. And, what and so, yeah. yeah, so I mean, it, it lived on in her. She did teach it to students, she did talk about it with students, but I think it got de-emphasized in the next generation. It kind of like, it wasn't that she stopped teaching it, it's that, um, Particular, you know, and, and I think certain lineages, I think John Harvey Gray's lineage 
knows this stuff more um, oh. in some level and talks about this stuff more. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, also with the, with, you know, what's called the Joshin Kokyu hole, right? The, the belly breathing that kind of purifies your heart mind, right? Mm -hmm. the, um, she taught this too. I mean, and I think um, Brian Brunius of the Reiki Centers of America, I think he has a tape of her. I'm not sure if he has a tape or if he just has a, he has kind of a photographic memory. And he told me, I have his telling of John teaching him, he was a master student of John Harvey Gregg, teaching him this meditation practice. And this is, you know, before Frank Petter starts publishing, you know, the Japanese Reiki techniques and stuff, you know, that, that he knew this technique about, you know, you breathe, it comes down through your crown, it goes down to your, the, you know, what I think John called your sacral chakra, because John was into yoga and, and chakras and stuff. But, you know, he says it goes down to, you know, below your navel, Mm -hmm. and you you bring the energy in there and then you expand it out and you know that this practice of of strengthening your lower abdomen is something Takata taught at least you know in the bay area um even if i, I you know i should ask I mean, not a lot of people left but you know rick bachner and, and paul mitchell and and you know mm -hmm. um maybe gretchen muncie and you know other people do you remember her talking about this meditation mm -hmm. but um as i understand i think it was something she taught in the first degree yeah, yeah 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 that that's another thing which is uh, fascinating for me um i i always had the impression that your personal state has an influence on how much reiki you are able to provide and i wondered how is this possible if we get the reiki in and just pass it on yeah. and then after doing some qigong research i came to uh the idea that uh the ray is what we receive and the key comes from our own abdomen. Uh, so uh, we have the rain plenty, but not the key. And this is why Uzui taught this, uh, this Hara strengthening exercises. And I, I found out m m myself, I do a lot of treatment. When my Hara is strong, when I'm really, you know, big energy in the Hara, healing goes very fast. Uh, and it, and it's, it strengthens the more I do Reiki especially mm -hmm. when I start in the morning, it's less than in the evening. I don't know whether there is something in your research which uh, gets some light on that. I don't personally have a good source for that, but um, Inamoto Hyakuten, right, from uh, Komyo Reiki? Just by name. Okay, he, he teaches something very similar to that, where oh, okay. he, so he, he is very much about, um, like, the, the day is, the power of the heaven, ten, yes. ten day, and key is the power of the earth, the chi. Right. Yes. And that humans are, you know, between heaven and earth, right? And that it's in us that the the day and the key kind of meet. Yeah, yeah. And from above and from below. Yeah. And and I think you know there's something what you're saying that 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 it's very close there. Um, yeah. No, I don't think he has necessarily a like historical source for that. I think it's more his kind of study of, you know, various teachings and kind of mm -hmm. his own experiences with Reiki, like you say, yeah, yeah. Um, where this is, but this is, I think, a, a central teaching in Komyo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, interesting. Oh, Justin, this is such an interesting talk with you. Yeah, no, I, and I, I'm really, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 as I said, I've, I've looked at some of your stuff before, but I, I, you know, I wasn't, and I've, I've watched some of your conversations before, but I think in this conversation, for the first time, I'm really sensing how much you intuit what, you know, other, in ways, things that, that other sources, I think, kind of confirm that you weren't really aware of, you know? So I think that's really a testament to that. You, you're onto a lot of things here, Walter. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a pleasure to connect with you in this way. Yeah, yeah same, same here. And I would be happy if we can uh, go on with this conversation sometime, if you if you like. Yeah, maybe a part two. I, I, um, yeah, unfortunately, as I told you via email, I've got so many things going on right yeah. now. I've got, I start teaching like classes again at the university in a couple of weeks and, uh, I'm trying to finish some writing as well because once classes start, I'm it's it's over until December. You know, I can't get anything else done. And yeah, yeah, I'm 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 a new.
professor at this university, or it's not professor, they call it instructor, but um, oh, wow. so all these courses I'm teaching are new to me and I'm learning so much. I mean, it's like going to grad school all over again, but it's very hard to balance getting writing done and being a good teacher. And But, uh, but one good thing though is this term, I'm teaching a course on health and healing in East Asia. Um, and so I'm reading a lot about you know Chinese medicine and um, that history. So I think that'll be beneficial for me. I'm teaching a course on folklore in China. And so I'll be learning you know a lot more about different kinds of ghost stories and monsters and you know, all kinds of things that I'm, I'm interested in. So I, mean, I think in the long run, it's very good for my um, grounding, you know, these things that I, I studied and also one about business in Japan. I'm teaching a course on business in Japan, which um, again, for thinking about things about maybe, you know, ideas about money and ideas about professionalism. And, you know, so I think in the long run, all these things that I've studied a little bit here and there, I'm actually gaining more expertise in but it, it's very time consuming and uh, yeah, but I would love to continue a part two, uh, you know, who knows, in a few months or something. Yes, of course. Whenever you have time, you know. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Justin, for your time and your efforts and your Thank research. You and I'm a fan of you. Thank you. Yeah. And if anyone wants to uh, read more of my stuff, I have a lot available for free online. Um, the website is Justin Stein. Uh, you, you can probably see the name in the YouTube uh, thing below. Maybe I can give you some links and you can put the links yes, in the YouTube. Put them just under, the, under our interview. Great. And then I also have a, yeah, a Facebook uh, thing where I'm sharing some of my uh, research. As I, whenever I have time, I, I, jot, I try to jot a little you know, thing here and there, but with some details that aren't in anywhere else. So. I, I see. Uh, just write, write an email to me what you would like to have mentioned in in the footnote you know of our interview and it will be there great thank you so much walter <laughs> thank you justin have a wonderful time bye bye you too bye